description so you can go check it out and make it yourself if you want to. Welcome to my channel. My name is Mary Mullet and we are the Mullet family and we want to thank all of our new subscribers. We're so happy you are here. We're happy you're joining us. Right now, I am in the process of making potato bread. Yep, I'm going to be putting some real potatoes in my bread. And also make sure to stay tuned all the way to the end of this video when Marvin and I sit down with my father, Ben Gerard, and interview him about his life growing up Old Order Amish on the farm in Bern, Indiana. And thanks again for joining us. If you like this content, please make sure to give us a like, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you are notified every time we post a new video. And don't forget to leave a comment. We love hearing from you. Now the next thing is the flower. This flower is white whole wheat flour. This bread is ready for the oven. And no, this is not wine or any kind of alcohol. It is my kom kombucha. It's much funner drinking your juice out of a nice glass. dough rise and double in size. Now it's time to turn it into loaves.
Cooking my bread dough before I bake it allows the steam to escape so that the loaves don't puff up in the oven. turned out. Here I'm basting the tops of each loaf with butter. It helps to keep the crust nice and soft. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. Today is the first of a few um, segments that we're gonna do on where do the Amish come from? How did they get started? Why do they believe what they believe? And how did those traditions get handed down all these generations? So first off, I wanna introduce myself. I am Marvin, this is my wife Mary. We're family Montana. And this is my father-in-law, Mary's dad, Ben Girard. Yep, we are honored and pleased to introduce to you uh, my father, Ben Gerard, who not only was an Amish preacher, you were also an ordained Amish bishop, yeah. right? Yeah. So first off, we're gonna we're gonna be asking uh, Ben some questions on just basically his earliest memories growing up Amish. Um, he has quite a story to tell. Um, so yeah, where uh, where did life begin for you? It began on a on a twenty acre farm in uh, Adams County, Indiana. Near, between uh, between two towns of Bern and Geneva. Okay. Uh, our dad's farm, a twenty acre farm, was located between those two towns. Uh, the whole community there in in uh, Bern and Geneva, uh, there were Amish and Mennonites and Reformed, all Swiss, that located in that area. So even the different denominations were of Swiss descent? Yes, many of them were. Wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. Well, I was six years old when my parents moved from the 20-acre farm to a 120-acre farm, about six miles from there. Oh, okay. And I remember as a six-year-old, I uh, rode with my dad on the wagon from, from the 20-acre farm to our new house and on the 120 acres. And this was in Bern, Indiana? This was in Bern, yeah. Okay. This, <clears throat> this 20 acre, this 120 acre farm was a mile and a half from Bern. So, how old were you when you moved from Bern, Indiana, and your family moved to Bowling Green, Missouri. I was, I was 10 years 10 old. 10 years old. So from six to 10, you lived on the 120 acre farm? Yes. We had a neighbor across the road. He was a Mennonite. His name was Rod Yoder, and he had a sawmill. And okay. uh, 
I watched that song, you know, buzzing day after day when I was <laughs> living across the road from him. What did your dad do? Was he? He was a farmer. Farmer, okay. Okay. And he was also an Amish bishop. Okay. So your dad was an Amish bishop also. Yes, he was. Okay. Pete Girard. Mm -hmm. My dad was the first Amish bishop in Bern, Indiana, Amish community that put up a parochial school. He, he put it up on his farm right there. That is where I got my first two years of education. But my dad received a lot of resistance for, for, for doing that, both from, from the civil authorities and from his own people. So the own, like the church members, uh -huh. he, he got uh, resistance yep. from them too. Some of them, yes. They, because up until then, uh, you were all going to public school, yes. right? Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Then after two years, uh, they would, uh, we, we never found out who did this, but they would push over the toilets and things like that. And finally, one night, uh, we woke up and somebody torched the schoolhouse. Burned it down. Burned it down to oh. the ground. My dad suffered a lot. He, he then decided to move out. We moved to Missouri from that place for us. Never forget my Swiss uh, relatives, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles mm -hmm. in Bern and Geneva area. All my uncles and aunts have now passed on. You mentioned Geneva and Bern. There's, those are two town names that are in Switzerland, aren't they? Yes, they are. Okay. Most of the Amish and the Mennonites come over from either Switzerland or Germany. Can you give us a little background? Who was our last descendant that came over from Switzerland? And where do we come from? Well, the migrations coming over from Europe began in the late 1700s. And they ended in 1853 when my relatives, forefathers, came out from from Alsace-Lorraine in France. Uh, they were Swiss, but because, and they grew up in Switzerland, but because of the severe persecution, they, they moved to Alsace. To Alsace, is mm -hmm. that in Switzerland? No, that's in France. And then uh, from there, they boarded a ship and came to this country. Now my, forefather that came over with his family. His name was John Swartz. In their language, they call him Johannes, the Johannes Schwartz. Yeah. And, and uh, do you know what year he, they came Yeah, over? they came over in 1853. 1853. Mm -hmm. I'm not that far removed from Switzerland, you know. Yeah. I heard my parents and and their generation often speak about Swiss, places in Switzerland and in France where, where they came from. So your, your grandparents would have also... My great-grandfather came over. Oh, your your great-grandfather, wow. Uh -huh. that, that is not very far removed. No, we're not, we were not far removed. Now, uh, Oliver, he, he also lived in Switzerland. And he came from uh, from the Jura Mountains. We got acquainted years later with with a Mennonite church in the Jura Mountains. And uh, one time while I was visiting there, one of the members told me, "Let's let's go see if we can find your forefathers' home." I said. How do you know where he lived? Well, I think we can find it. So we went, we went up higher up on the Jura Mountains and, and uh, we went to a place he thought it was, but it was not. But then we stopped and talked with another Gerard uh, couple that we met on the road and she immediately knew where we wanted to go. And so this is only a mile further. And we found it. You found it. Wow. You found the place, yeah. like the like the farm or the. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
This is where Oliver, my great grandfather, grew up, right on this farm. And it, it, it was still owned by the Gerard family. Oh, and, wow. And when, I, when they took me into the house and they laid out all the descendants that they had uh, discovered, and I found my lineage right there. Wow. And uh, then the woman took wow. me outside in the barn and showed me uh, initials that were carved in, in the wood, and that was Abraham Gerard, and that was Oliver's dad. Wow. <laughs> what was that like to walk where your ancestors had walked? Was well, it like like just a really strange feeling? Yes, it was. Uh, I just I just marveled and looked the landscape around the bounds of the farm and. You know, that, that house was the house and barn come by like they are in Switzerland and many places. So Ben, your, your childhood was not quite normal. You had four siblings that were affected with muscular dystrophy. Uh, enlighten us on that. What, what was it like to live with not one, two, but four siblings that needed to be tended to? They were all older than me, so I grew up with this. It was just a way of life to just help care for them. Were they always in wheelchairs to your earliest memory? Or no, no. It, it develops very slowly. You first notice it when they uh, can't run so fast anymore. And finally they come to a point where they uh, uh, can't run at all. But finally they come to a point where he had to help him get up from from bed and from the table and at what age was the earliest that it was maybe hey something's going on here probably about six or eight years old uh, it was something that disturbed me very much that, that we had uh, we had to contend with it and there was not, nothing we could do about it yeah, Dad, I have many memories in of my uncle and aunt in wheelchair, yeah. yeah. I remember you would go to every house and give them treatments, massage their muscles. Your dad took my uncle Davy to mm -hmm. uh, Spears Chiropractic Hospital yes. uh, sometime in the 1960s, right? No, it was 1954. 1954, and he had so much success that... I don't know how old you were, you were quite young, but you decided in your heart someday you're going to take all your siblings there. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, 12 years after Dad took David there for the first time, I took all four of them. And I, I worked hard to earn the money to pay for it. I thought I had enough money. How much did you have saved up? I cannot say I that. I think it was around a thousand. Well, it was more than that. Oh, okay. It, it had to be because it, Spears Hospital was a thousand miles away and we had to get a driver to take us, you know, and all this cost a lot. So after we got there, uh, they took examinations of each one of them. And I had to pay the first week in advance and the transportation. When all that was paid off, I was already out of money. Oh, my. One week. One week. And I was in total shock. Because this, this institution was, was owned by a private person, so we went and talked to them about our situation. They were very kind. They said, well, since I'm there to help them, they'll give me room and board free. So that was a, a great consolation. But how we were going to raise this money to stay there for three months, because they had to stay three months to, for any kind of a benefit. We didn't know how. how. As time went on, the debt started growing. And in today's calculations, I was in debt up to $120,000. Wow. And I, I did not know what to do. So I, I had a room in the dormitory where I slept in the night. In the daytime, I helped my siblings uh, go through the treatments. The various, they had various treatments that they went through during the day. 
But at night, I went to my dormitory, number one, room number six. It was late at night, and I went, when I went to my dormitory room to sleep. But before I went to sleep, I fell on my knees in intercession to the Lord. Because I didn't know how, how we, we was going to get out of this. We were ready more, in more debt than what I could pay off myself. In this one evening, as I was interceding, all of a sudden, the floor beneath me began shaking violently, and I jumped up. I was totally shocked. But at the same time, I felt the presence of the Lord. The following night, I had a what I call a dream or vision, and it seemed to go all night. And the Lord spoke to me in that vision and showed me how he was going to pay that all. The vision was so, so intense that when I woke up, I thought it had already taken place. Wow. You got up and you thought it already happened. Yeah. When I realized it, it didn't actually happen, I, I was, it was a letdown. But then the following four weeks, as they unfolded, it unfolded as I seen it in that vision. So everything came to pass yes. that you saw in that dream. Yes, it did. Wow. So here you were, were you 21, 22? 22. 22 years old, desperately wanted to help your siblings. Um, communication back in those days was not what it is today. Not at all. You probably did the, you know, did the best you could, work your tail off to earn enough money. Mm -hmm. And one week in advance, you everything you'd worked for was already gone. Yes, it was. I, I mean, can't, yeah, think about that. Imagine that kind of stress. You had to be there for three months, and one week in advance, um, the finances, everything you'd worked for, for that hard, was already gone. But God came through, yes, he and did. he paid. So... Um, can, can you go into detail how, how the Lord answered those prayers as far as uh, bringing the funds in? That's a good question. I'd like to answer that. That is, uh, somebody in, in one of the uh, communities, we probably didn't have half of the Amish communities then that we have today. But I, I believe we got funds from nearly every Amish community in the land. Wow. Very clearly. And uh, some, we have a, a, an Amish newspaper that, that, that the Amish get throughout. Mm -hmm. It's called The Budget. It is printed in Sugar Creek, Ohio. And somebody put a, a request in there for, for my four siblings. They needed money. All of a sudden, we started, I didn't know this, but all of a sudden we started getting letters from, from Amish people almost all across the nation. And this kept up and kept up. Sometimes the hospital had its own post office. Oh, okay. okay. They sometimes, some days brought us, us as many as 20 letters. Oh, wow. Wow. And these all had some money in it. In this way, we started paying off on the debt, and uh, every every weekend I went and paid paid as much as I had, and I kept doing this every week until finally we paid it off. Yay! That's was it. Was <laughs> it was it paid off before you left at the end of three months? Oh yeah. The, the budget is probably the Amish version of uh, social media. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 